reading now from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. I'm going to read from chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And this is commonly known as the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus also told this parable to people who were sure of their own goodness and despised everyone else. Once there were two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood apart by himself and prayed, I thank you, God, that I'm not greedy, dishonest, or an adulterer like everybody else. I thank you that I'm not like the tax collector over there. I fast two days a week, and I give you one-tenth of all my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even raise his face to heaven but beat on his breast and said, God, have pity on me, a sinner. I tell you, said Jesus, the tax collector and not the Pharisee was in the right with God when he went home. For those who make themselves great will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be made great. So, who are you most like in the story I just read? The Pharisee or the tax collector? Who are you most like? It's hard. Isn't it? To hear this parable without placing yourself in one role or the other, or perhaps both. Like the Pharisee, who among us has not felt a bit smug on Sunday morning? Oh God, we whisper under our breath. I thank you that I'm not like other people. Like my neighbor next door who was off golfing this morning instead of being here in the service. Like Natalie over there who's in the other political party and obviously doesn't know God's will for our country. Thank God I'm not like them. I'm here every Sunday and at least two days a week. I confess my sin every Sunday. I pledge faithfully. And I serve on three committees. Hooray for me! And boo-hoo for all those who do not follow the rules like I do. Or volunteer as much as I do. Or act as I do. Or think as I do. Thank you, God, that I'm not like them. So let's be honest. For some of us, it's only when we mess up big time, isn't it, that we gain the humility of the tax collector. Those in recovery programs call it hitting rock bottom. Right? It seems it's only when we make those big, big mistakes that we recognize our need for God's grace and forgiveness. Only then 
do we echo the words of the tax collector? God, have pity on me, a sinner. Seems like an easy parable to understand, doesn't it? A straightforward story about the dangers of spiritual pride and the benefits of humble confession. Right? Be like the tax collector and not like the Pharisee. But folks, parables are like fishing lures. They're full of attractive features like feathers and bright colors. But they always seem to end with a sharp little barb. Right? Pharisees and tax collectors, let's face it, they've become like stock biblical figures to us. Like little cardboard cutouts that we use to teach our children. Like I said last week, there are trigger words in any biblical passage that automatically move our thoughts to a certain place. And the words Pharisee and tax collector are just such trigger words. As soon as we read or hear the word Pharisee, right away we visualize a self-righteous, hard-nosed, rule-bound clergyman lacking in compassion and insight. In our mind's eye, we see a puffed-up cleric in fine robes sporting wonderful jewelry, shouting, Look at me, folks! Look at me! Look at how perfect I am! And right away, when we hear the story I told this morning, we say to ourselves, oh, I'm glad I'm not like him! God, I'm glad I'm not like that darn Pharisee! It's ironic, isn't it? Think about it. In our mind, we use the same words in thinking about the Pharisee in our story and about others in the church and perhaps our community as the Pharisee uses in thinking about the tax collector. What happened there? Thank God that I'm not like him. But it's ironic. At times, we're exactly like the Pharisee. We prefer to see ourselves playing the role of the tax collector. There's no doubt. Repentant, meek, and simple, and gentle, and humble. But in fact, we're more like the Pharisee than we care to admit. And yet, we continue to ignore the irony in our thinking. We reassure ourselves day after day that we're the humble ones, the simple ones, the repentant ones, like the tax collector. Oh, how perfect we are. But before we become too puffed up with pride, you have to know, you have to know that the Pharisees, like most United Church people today, not all, but most United Church people today, held to a liberal interpretation of Scripture. 
They were religious people, and they were leaders among their fellow Jews. But they were not priests, dressed in their fine robes, sporting the fine jewelry, and wearing those funny hats. They never presided at temple worship. Rather, they were mostly teachers and spiritual guides. And they were guides for those who sought to follow God's law faithfully. The aim of the Pharisees was to teach scripture and help anyone who cared to observe Torah law. That was their role in society. They were known to be very careful in religious observance, and they were known to be super generous with their money. They were good people. They got a bum rap. They were pious people. And from all accounts, they certainly loved God. Now, tax collectors, on the other hand, were seen as collaborators with the hated Romans. They were not seen as being humble or simple. More accurately, they were seen as being unscrupulous and dishonest, willing to do almost anything to promote their own self-interest. Tax collectors commonly stole from those they taxed and they pocketed the money for themselves. They accepted bribes as a matter of routine. They were mostly collaborators and thieves who held tight to the Romans for their own well-being and far more loosely to God. All this to say that we must be careful when trying to fix labels to people based on their profession or what political party they have joined or how much they participate in the life and the work of the church. Because in, in my view, human beings are never one-dimensional in their makeup not so simple. Human beings are far from simple. Cardboard cutouts. We're not built that way. Human beings vacillate between good and bad, love and rejection, inclusion and exclusion, pious pride and humility before God. We go back and forth. Human beings are constantly in motion. We're forever in a state of flux and of learning and of change. Which is why on your bulletin cover this morning, it's really difficult to choose which person represents you best, the Pharisee or the tax collector. Because if you look, don't they almost look the same? Which hopefully will lead you to think that maybe when we take them together, they represent us well. That in fact, we all have a little bit of Pharisee and a little bit of tax collector within us. And maybe, just maybe, that's exactly how God sees us. Yet still, despite the fact, loves us anyway. I'm going to tell you a little story. It's a legend, in fact, to illustrate what I mean. So 
some of you may have already heard the story. Bear with me. This is for the benefit of those who have not. As was his custom, a Cherokee elder sat one evening in front of the fire with his little grandson at his knee. But this evening was not like any other, for the little boy had such a look of anger on his face. Grandfather said, come, sit, tell me what happened today. The child sat and leaned his chin on grandfather's knee, looking up into the wrinkled brown face and the kind dark eyes. The child's anger soon turned to quiet tears as he began to tell his story. I went into town today with father to trade the furs he collected over the last few months. I was happy to go because father said that since I had helped him with the trapping, I could get something for myself, something just for me. I was so excited to be at the trading post. There were so many things to choose from that I just couldn't seem to make up my mind. Finally, I spotted a shiny metal knife with a carved wood handle. So father got it for me. Here the boy laid his head down on grandfather's knee and became silent. Grandfather placed his hand softly on the boy's raven black hair. And then what happened? he asked. Without lifting his head, the boy replied, I went outside to wait for father and to admire my new knife in the sunlight. Some town boys came by. They saw me. They surrounded me. They started yelling bad things about me. They called me a dirty, stupid Indian and said that I shouldn't have such a fine knife. The biggest boy, he pushed me hard, and I fell backwards over the other boys. I dropped my knife, and one of them snatched it up, and they all ran away laughing. Here, the boy's anger returned. I hate them, he cried out. I hate them all. grandfather, with eyes that have seen too much, lifted his grandson's face so his eyes looked deep into his own. Grandfather said, let me tell you a story. I too at times have felt a great hate for those who have stood against me, with no apparent sorrow for what they do. But hate wears you down. It does not hurt your enemy. It's like you taking poison and then wishing that your enemy would die. I have struggled with these feelings many times. The young boy's eyes were as wide as saucers as he listened to his grandfather go on. It's as if there were two hungry wolves fighting inside of me. One is white, the other is black. The white wolf is good and does no harm. He lives in harmony with all around him and does not take offense when no offense was intended. He will fight only when it is right to do so and only in the proper way. For what is most important to the white wolf is love, joy and peace, patience, kindness and generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But the black wolf, now 
he is full of anger. The littlest thing will set him off in a big fit of temper. He fights everyone all the time and for no apparent reason. He cannot think because his anger and his hate are so great. It is helpless anger, for it will change nothing. He thrives on superiority and resentment and jealousy, quarreling and dissension and envy, arrogance, hostility, and division. Sometimes it's hard to live with these two wolves inside of me. For both of them try to dominate my spirit. The same fight is going on inside of you and inside of every other person too. The young boy looked intently into grandfather's eyes thinking about what he had said. And after a short pause, he asked, Grandfather, which wolf will win? The wise and seasoned elder smiled. And he replied simply, Why, the one you feed. grace, the people said. <laughs>